Hi everyone, I'm Kenneth. And I'm Matt. And we are the Movie Meisters. And we just saw Hail Caesar. So, um, Matt, what is Hail Caesar about? Hail Caesar is about a communist plot to kidnap a movie star for reasons that are never really well explained. <laughs> and also the inner journey of the uh, director of a movie studio. What what is the, that job <laughs> called? I don't think I, they ever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Either. I think he's just the head of the uh, head of Capital Pictures. But he, he said he reports to some other guy in New York. I enjoyed it. It's really, I think, a director's movie. Everything about this movie that's good is really about the direction. There's some good performances, but they're all kind of coordinated in a particular way in order to make the movie just so. It's clear that everyone who is acting is doing so under heavy direction because all the performances line up in a particular style that suits the movie. The plot resolves at the end, but it's kind of just like a little footnote or aftermath. It's not what the movie's about. So um, I'm a big fan of the Coen brothers. This movie reminded me of a lot of The Big Lebowski just because The Big Lebowski has a very, very thin plot. I mean, the whole idea of someone being kidnapped is just, it's a very, very minor aspect of the movie. The whole thing is just about seeing these hijinks happen. And one thing I really enjoyed about this movie is how much it delves into, I guess, just the politics of running a studio uh, in, I guess it's supposed to be the 1950s. In regards to a lot of the characters, it's about image. Um, the studio is telling you to go out with this person because it, it'll make reporters, oh, want to say something about this instead of some other thing. And it just it's just a constant barrage of this funny thing is happening, this funny thing is happening, and this is the sort of thing that I guess a studio head like the Josh Brolin character would deal with. Yeah, it was a lot of fun just uh, seeing that unfold. I feel like this movie has kind of two layers going on. One layer is like frame in frame of you looking at a screen. And that's the cheesiest bits, right? The actors are most over the top, a parody of the way Hollywood works and the cheesiness of the movies. But then at the other layer, the layer of the plot, the performances are also a little bit cheesy and over the top up till, you know, having the communist submarine show up. It gets a little <laughs> ridiculous. But it's very playful, the whole tone of it. It's playing a little bit with your emotions, like, oh, here's some great things about Hollywood, but then aren't they also a little bit silly? Like, it's showing you different versions of classic scenes from old movies, or at least something that's analogous to a classic scene from an old movie, but just a little bit sillier, so you kind of, you know, you can't take it seriously, but then the enterprise of making the movie is also not taken very seriously. So you feel like they, it's not like a, a mean-spirited criticism of what Hollywood is like. It's a very playful uh, depiction. So many scenes reflect that. Like, they have this whole bit where the communists are explaining their plan to one of the characters, and there's so many little jokes in there about, like, the hypocrisy of the communists. Like, oh, they're, they're for the working man, but all they want is, like, their own money, like, their own revenge, and they get they live in this, like, posh house together and stuff. And it's just, again, it's not a mean spirit. It's not, like, a biting criticism. It's nobody writing this movie is thinking, oh, these communist writers. No, it's just a lot of... Fun. Yes. And T it's fun. tongue firmly in cheek the whole time, yeah. So we were treated to an extended uh, tap dancing number, right? In the movie world that this is supposed to be taking place in, that huge, incredibly detailed choreographed tap dancing number takes place in one take. And if something needs to be changed on the set, there are like people coming in on the side of the set, changing it on the fly and stuff. Like, the world in the movie that's supposed to be the real Hollywood is itself kind of a romanticism of the way that Hollywood works. There's no way that this thing takes place in one take with, like, ten different camera angles. Right. <laughs> and it's just, it's fun. Yeah, I, I loved I loved how lighthearted that... I, yeah. And, and then they take scene, the yeah. wind out of it at the end. Yeah. They point out, because then, you know, the director has some tiny problem yeah. with this huge thing that took five minutes to do, and it's like, <laughs> oh, I guess we're going to reshoot this entire... <laughs> 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 I, I love I love the part with George Clooney where he's giving this long dramatic speech. Even the people, yes. even the crew, they're they're like, oh wow, this is a big it flubs the line. It's great. It's so much fun. This movie's like um, I don't know. In some ways, I was thinking a much lighter version of Birdman. I mean, that was like more uh, more general in regards to the entertainment ind industry. This one's more to one studio specific to movie making and just. That's, that's the thing about the Coen brothers. They're very good at capturing old Hollywood. So once again, going back to the Big Lebowski, he has that whole dream sequence, you know, with the women and the legs and that whole dancing uh, sequence. And Coen brothers are, are just great at capturing that sort of thing. 
Right, but it's always a romanticized version. Like right. when they're walking around the studio lots and they're on the set, the color is weird. I don't know how to explain It's kind of like when you see an early Technicolor movie or a movie that's black and white has been colorized. The color is kind of, it's faded or dated in just, just a certain way that it's kind of this world that we back out into after we're done shooting the movies is also this kind of campy version. Yeah. It was fun seeing some familiar faces. I know you pointed out Robert Picardo. Yeah, Robert Picardo. So... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're listening to this and you're a casting director, please watch this movie and consider hiring Robert Picardo for your next week. Because, I, mean, you know, growing up as a child watching the Star Trek Voyager, right, Robert Picardo is the uh, diamond in the rough in this <laughs> show, and yeah. he's such a great uh, character and performance. And he's a good actor in general. Yes. So he shows up, he does a damn fine job. This The character he plays this movie is nothing like the character <laughs> I'm used to from my childhood, but he's just a good actor. I was also happy to see Christopher Lambert in his very, very brief scene, just because I'm a fan of his... I, I'm not, I, I can't even say I'm a fan of his. I liked him in Highlander, and I'm just like, I, li- I like seeing this guy. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, I do. It, it was pleasant. <laughs> the movie has a lot of really great bits. It, it would establish something throughout the whole movie, but there, there's just a long series of little plot lines that are all resolved in their own way by the end. So you have the uh, Scarlett Johansson character. She's she's pregnant. The studio still wants to maintain her image, so she has to find a way, some kind of loophole, to make it seem like, oh, she isn't some kind of floozy. She's a family-oriented to, type of person. And then you have the uh, cowboy guy who wants to change his image from the singing cowboy into uh, some higher-class actor, or the studio wants him to change his image. And then you have that great scene with Ray, Fi- him and Ray Fiennes you know, playing off each other. Oh, by the way, there's an amazing scene in this movie about saving things in editing, where <laughs> that character is ter- reads his lines terribly, and then they show how the rough footage of what the movie's going to look like. And obviously the director has completely reworked the way things are going to be shot, and the editor has completely reworked the way things get cut together to <laughs> make right. that performance work, even though it's just... <laughs> Yes. And they make you see it twice from different angles just to like reinforce the fact that it's grading. But then you see the final one. It's like, yes, it's almost as if it's like Jaws, you know, like this is the way it was meant to be. (laughs) That's right. It's so great. Yeah, I feel like the the end, it's it's kind of like a morality tale where it ends on a moral. But Mm. again, since the attitude of the movie is so playful, you're not sure whether you should take it seriously. Right. The idea is, well... The main character has this opportunity for this better job, working for Lockheed, and they are making the A-bomb, and he can be the head of whatever. In the end, he doesn't make a decision because, you know, he thinks A-bombs are bad or whatever. I guess he feels like he's the eye of the storm of this crazy thing, and he likes that. Even though it's difficult, he enjoys making movies. And it's just kind of like, is making movies the best thing in the world? Like, are we like the communist character, you know, inserting little messages for the working man so they can like rise up? Like, no, that's <laughs> kind of ridiculed a little bit, you know? Yeah. Is it some grand thing where, you know, at, at least we're, we're using our things towards art and not towards war? So, like, no, it's not really that either. It's just, well, it, making movies feels right and <laughs> we're going to make movies. Yeah, something right in the middle. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I loved uh, his scene with uh, George Clooney's character, where George Clooney seems to have gone through this experience. He's he's some somehow That's enlightened, right. <laughs> and and uh, Josh Brolin's not having it. He's like, no, this is what's going on. This is what we're doing. And I loved. I, I they showed it from a great perspective because. This is the guy who has to deal with all of these other characters. And when he's meeting with the guy from Lockheed, he's telling him, you know, you really want to deal with that circus? And you watch the movie. It's a circus. You know, they they don't hold back on, show, on showing how nuts it is. At the same time, you have that little twinkle in your eye. Just like, yeah, this is... Uh... Yeah, it was good. At the same time, I feel like it seems to end in a way as if it's about that character and decisions he makes, but right. the rest of the movie isn't really about him. It's just kind <laughs> That's of... true. It happened. The ending is about him, I guess. But I don't, it's not... If the plot is supposed to be about movie making and what movie making means, it's not very well conveyed in <laughs> right. the rest of the movie. Maybe that's the ironic touch to the movie, too, because I you know, I, I got that feeling, you know, the, the tongue-in-cheekness, and then this is the facade of a, of a movie. It's not really that. It's a series of little, uh, little vignettes that kind of string together, and then, oh, here's a moral at the end because we need to end the movie or something. But it's done in a way where... You know, it's del- it feels deliberate to me. Where it's just, you know, you're not supposed to be caught up in. Um, I guess the character's name is Eddie Mannix. Is is crisis of deciding whether to leave this life or to go into another life. No, I don't know. I thought that was another layer of satire. 
there's serious shit going on here about the gospel of Christ, right? Right. Which he does not give two shits about. That's he right. And he clearly, from the confessional, he, he doesn't know what he's supposed to be confessing. Right. <laughs> then you have things like communism, which he doesn't give a shit about. He doesn't care <laughs> about the fact that the guy in New York might be, you know, the big cheese who gets all the money and they're just like wage slaves or whatever. He just doesn't care about it. That's right. He doesn't care about looking after the welfare of his children. <laughs> he doesn't care about the fact that the atomic bomb exists. Uh, the, the, the fact that those those little uh, dark moments are in the back of your mind, though, I think that's to the credit of the writers and so on. So, you know, it's but it's just there in the background, maybe adding to the satire. The Coen brother, Brothers movies that you've seen, does it does this compare to them? I know you've seen Big Lebowski and Serious Man and so on. Uh, I don't know. I feel like... Oh, brother, where art thou? Uh, this one, I don't think it... I mean, the world of Serious Man is the real world. Mm -hmm. The Big Lebowski is like the real world slightly stylized to humorous effect. Yeah. But it's still very grounded. And then, uh, Oh Brother, Art Thou, we're getting more on the silly side. That's But true. it has a kind of mythical character. Like whenever something crazy happens, it feels like it's part of this tall tale that's going on. But yeah. this movie, not only the movies that are shown, but also the framing of the way Hollywood works is also tongue in cheek. It's lacking a little bit. It feels like it's free-floating like this is all maybe one kind of giant wink or irony or something and it doesn't really grab me you know like there's bits true, in like yeah. oh brother art thou has some wacky stuff in it but there's a scene where they're digging graves and singing and it's just like god damn right like, that <laughs> yeah you can't really forget that scene i feel like but with this movie i i think i could forget Every scene in it. I mean, yeah. I really liked a lot. Of it. Yeah. I love that editing thing. I think that's like <laughs> that's the, great. The yeah. best yeah. bit. It's teaching you something about direction and editing while using direction and editing to show you. It's very uh, delightful. I don't. It it doesn't capture my imagination. <laughs> that's true. I mean, you you look at uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou. You look at you look at The Big Lebowski. You can point out individual scenes, and it's just like I love that line. I love that line. Those really stick with you. I mean, maybe we maybe it's the virtue of having seen those multiple times, where it's just like I remember this individual part and. Yeah, this this movie doesn't quite stick the same way that those other films do, but it's still really, really good. I love the the commentary on old Hollywood. I I loved uh, I love the direction and I yeah the Coen brothers really know what they're doing. Yeah, it's a good movie. I think the plotting is not great, probably on purpose. It's a good movie. All right, we are the movie meisters saying cinema. It's not a slice of life, but a piece of cake. <laughs>